welcome to another historical fiction author chat starring my friend Kim Fanakamade. And this is supporting her book, which comes out in one week, July 19. 18. 18. Okay, yeah. And this is, that's the one that she sent me, so it's early. And I have a really nice little, oh, there. See, yours doesn't have this in it, though, this nice little. I know. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was one of the very, very first ones they printed up for me. Thank you. It's uh, it's a great book. It's, there's so much in it, like so many little bits and pieces. But we'll chat about that. Um, I'm very happy to have you here. Thank um, you. I haven't seen Kim person to person since 2015. She and I actually got to go and do a book event with mm -hmm. Susanna Kearsley mm -hmm. in Whitby, Ontario. Mm -hmm. That was fun. It was really wonderful. It was so wonderful to meet you both and to have read your books and I've read your books since then. And uh, yeah, I, that that connection. I remember you, you were going off to do research somewhere right after the book event for it, as we always are, right? <laughs> it was it was really wonderful. Yeah, it was, it was really fun. It was a big, big moment for me. That was right after my first book, right after Tides of Honor and, and meeting both of you was like, mm -hmm. oh, so great. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. I'm going to read Kim's bio first and then on to the synopsis. And then, uh, you know, then I'm going to disappear. We all, does everyone have their tea and biscuits? Everyone's ready to relax and sit back? Kim's got a beautiful excerpt to read to us. Um, so I will start off with the bio, as always. And Kim, am I saying your last name correctly? Can you say it to me? Kim? Van Alcamada. I did it right, kind of. Yay! All right. Yeah, it's a Dutch name. My my dad was born in Rotterdam. It's actually one of the inspirations for Counting Lost Stars. So we can talk about that. Yes, please. All right. Before becoming an author, Kim was a professor at Shippensburg University of Pennsylvania, where she taught creative writing. Her debut novel, Orphan Number 8, about a woman who confronts the doctor who conducted medical experiments on her at a Jewish orphanage in the 1920s, appeared on the New York Times bestseller list and has been translated into 11 languages. Inspired by true events, her second novel, Bachelor Girl, is about a jazz age actress in New York City who receives a surprise inheritance from the millionaire owner of a Yankees baseball team. That was such a fun book. <laughs> Thank you. Her third historical novel, Counting Lost Stars, about an unwed college student who has given up her baby for adoption, helping a Holocaust survivor search for his lost mother, was inspired in part by her father's experiences in Nazi-occupied Holland. Kim was born in New York City and now makes her home in Saratoga Springs, New York, with her partner, their two rescue dogs, and a couple of feisty backyard chickens. <laughs> I think we talked about chickens in that in that ride that day. I know. Um, actually, one of the chickens is not feeling well today. She's broody. Oh, but and... that's the best. Because <laughs> they feel like teddy bears when you pick them up. Oh, they're so warm. Mm -hmm. I don't have chickens anymore. Oh. We, we moved and not allowed, but I can still mm. live vicariously through. <laughs> All right. The synopsis for Counting Lost Stars. It's 1960 in New York City. College student Rita Klein is a pioneering woman in the, field, in the new field of computer programming until she unexpectedly becomes pregnant. At the Hudson Home for Unwed Mothers, social workers pressure her into surrendering her baby for adoption. Rita is struggling to get on with her life when she meets Jacob Nassi, a charming yet troubled man from the Netherlands who was traumatized by his childhood experience of being separated from his mother during the Holocaust. When Rita learns that Hitler's final solution was organized using Hollerith punch card computers, she sets out to find the answers that will help Jacob heal. 1941, going back 19 years, in The Hog, The Hague. I never the Hague. Said, the Hague. Why do they say The Hague? Okay, The Hague. Well, if, it's, if you were saying it in Dutch, you were right, because they say Den Haag. Oh, well, there you go. That's, maybe that's what it is. That's sure. <laughs> that. I'll take that. Cornelia Vogel is working as a punch card operator at the Ministry of Information when a census of Holland's population is ordered by the Germans. After the ministry acquires a Hollerith computer made in America, Cornelia is tasked with translating its instructions from English into Dutch. She seeks help from her fascinating Jewish neighbor, Leah Blom, an unconventional young woman whose mother was born in New York. When Cornelia learns the census is being used to persecute Holland's Jews, she risks everything to help Leah escape. After Rita uncovers a connection between Cornelia Vogel and Jacob's mother, long buried secrets come to light. 
Will shocking revelations tear them apart? Or will learning the truth about the past enable Rita and Jacob to face the future together? It's a really, I, I can't wait to talk to you about this. There's so much. To oh, talk thank about. you. So I will now disappear. Oh, okay. Just in time because my cat just jumped in the desk. And I have to <laughs> so I'm going to disappear and mute myself and off you go. Kim's going to tell you a little bit about this excerpt mm -hmm. that she's doing. And then, uh, then we'll see you again. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm going to read from the opening chapter of Counting Lost Stars. But I did some editing, so it's a little easier to follow if you're listening, because the chapter includes like these backstory sections and uh, runs a little longer than I think you might want to uh, sit to listen. So um, if you read the book, you'll you'll read all these words, but you'll read a few more <laughs> as well. Um, so let me take a sip of tea. And I'll start reading. I first suspected they were lying to me when my skirt didn't fit. No matter how I tugged at the zipper or sucked in my stomach, I couldn't make the waistband bridge that gap of flesh between the hook and its eye. So there I stood, feet flat on the floor of the hospital room, flummoxed. And I'll just take a step back to say, this is the first chapter is in the first person voice of Rita Klein. So we're in that 1960 time frame. Um, that uh, jean viev mentioned, uh, the other chapters, they switch back and forth between the 1940s chapters. So we're going to start in 1960, and this is where I'm going to stay for what I'm reading to you. So Rita Klein is in a hospital room flummoxed. They'd all promised, the doctor, the social worker, even my own mother, that I'd be back to normal once it was over. My blouse had buttoned up, okay, why not the skirt? Maybe it was stupid of me to think a garment I hadn't worn in months would fit again so soon, but what did I know? They were the ones who told me what to expect. All I did was believe them. I tried the zipper again, refusing to credit the evidence of my own body. At every meal for the past five months, whenever we'd complained about the meager portions, the house matron had assured us the restrictive diet was designed to get us back in our old clothes as quickly as possible. We'd all followed the same diet. If my clothes didn't fit, it was likely no one else's did either. But if they'd lied to us about the food, was the rest of it a lie too? I shook the thought from my head. It was ridiculous to think all those professional people were involved in some elaborate deception. I reminded myself it only happened three days ago. Today I was going home. Starting tomorrow, I'd put all this behind me and get on with my life. At least the food had given us girls something to talk about. We were all too ashamed to share the circumstances that had gotten us in trouble. We weren't even supposed to reveal our real names, let alone exchange telephone numbers for staying in touch or addresses for visiting. Whenever I tried bringing up a topic from the day's headlines, the conversation fell flat. Current events like that U-2 spy plane shot down over the Soviet Union felt too remote to matter while we were sequestered in that isolated mansion. When Mossad agents brazenly captured Adolf Eichmann in Argentina, even the other Jewish girls weren't interested in the prospect of that murderous Nazi going on trial in Israel. No one even seemed to care whether or not John F. Kennedy got the Democratic nomination, which I guess made sense. Most of the girls were too young to vote. And anyway, whichever man ended up in the White House wouldn't change a thing for those of us biding our time at the Hudson Home for Unwed Mothers. I twisted the skirt around in frustration, fruitlessly attempting to zip it from the front. Back when I was getting ready for the trip upstate, I hadn't packed much into the pink Samsonite my parents had given me as a high school graduation present. It was winter then, and my wardrobe was down to a couple of shapeless dresses, a few loose blouses, a stretched out sweater, and a cuffed pair of my brother's blue jeans. On top of this sad pile of fabric, I carefully placed the skirt I'd bought back in August, for my night out with Leonard. It was the most sophisticated article of clothing I'd ever purchased. The black linen modestly lined in silk, yet snug enough to hint at the garter clips holding up my stockings. The sales girl at Macy's assured me it would be perfect for a date with a businessman from out of town. That she thought the man in question was a matrimonial prospect went without saying. In New York City in 1959, 
it was a pretty safe bet that any girl in her 20s who wasn't already hitched was on the hunt for a husband. I'd have sworn I was immune, but after I met Leonard, I couldn't resist walking past the jewelry stores on 47th Street, window shopping diamond rings. I was disappointed when the summer computing course we took together at the Watson Laboratory ended and Leonard went back to a sales job at IBM's headquarters in Endicott. I resigned myself to never seeing him again, so it caught me by surprise when he called to say he was coming to the city for the weekend and asked if I would join him for dinner at the Rainbow Room. Once I said yes, I couldn't help fantasizing about a proposal by dessert. I told myself to stop being silly. It would be our first official date. And besides, I wasn't planning to marry until after college. Some of the girls at Barnard were more interested in making a curriculum of the men at Columbia than studying for their own exams. But I'd gone there for a Bachelor of Arts, not an MRS degree. Not that married women couldn't graduate. Plenty of girls disappeared from campus while on their honeymoons, returning a few weeks later adorned with gold rings, new names, and satisfied smiles. Well, the joke's on me, I thought. I'd been away for an entire semester with nothing to show for it. Less than nothing. As if it never happened. That's what everyone promised, and I was determined to take them at their word. But if the nine months between that summer night with Leonard and this spring morning were no more than missing pages torn from the calendar of my life, then why wasn't I able to get my skirt back on? I gave it one last try, but there was no fitting the unforgiving linen over the loose pudding of my abdomen. I shoved it down to my ankles and tossed it in the suitcase. Instead, I pulled out that pair of jeans. Never mind, I told myself, tucking in my blouse and stepping into penny loafers. I never wanted to wear that skirt again anyway. I went over to the sink to splash my face with cold water. Looking in the mirror, I saw my cheeks were still puffy, but... Other than that, my reflection was the same as it had been before. Brown eyes, long nose, thin lips, round chin. In high school, when my rich friends were getting nose jobs for their sweet 16, mom said there was nothing wrong with the way I looked, which wasn't the same as saying I was beautiful. I wouldn't win any contests, but I guessed I was pretty enough. I was rustling a comb through my curly hair when a perfunctory knock followed by a waft of perfume announced the entrance of Miss Murphy. I sneezed, thinking for the umpteenth time what a mistake it was for a social worker to douse herself in Shalimar. I'd learned in psychology class about the power of scent to trigger the brain. How was I supposed to wipe away the memory of those months, I wondered, if any time I smelled bergamot and vanilla, I'd be reminded of this exact moment. Hello, Rita. I'm glad to see you dressed and ready to go. Miss Murphy was an efficient and professional woman whose heavy perfume was at odds with her pleated skirts and school marmish cardigans. A few of the girls at the Hudson home figured she must be a lesbian, like that teacher in Lillian Hellman's play. But I didn't think that was fair to say just because a woman was still single in her 30s. I never knew what a darling figure you have. Turn around and let me take a look at you. My outfit hardly deserved a fashion show, but I did as I was told. Miss Murphy put down her briefcase and came closer. This will go away in no time, she said, placing the palm of her hand on the bulge of my belly without so much as a please. Has the bleeding stopped yet? I sat on the edge of the hospital bed as she pulled up the visitor's chair. It's tapered off, and I've been walking up and down the corridor like you suggested. She gave an approving nod. The doctor tells me everything went well. Really? I wouldn't know, I guess. The truth was, I didn't remember the birth at all. When my water broke three days ago at dawn, the house matron had packed up my suitcase and put me in a taxi for the short ride to the local hospital. I labored by myself, the private room a lonely luxury. It wasn't long before I was crying for my mother. I couldn't understand why she wasn't with me when I needed her most. She'd been there when I had my tonsils out and the time I got stitches after falling off my bike. She'd never left my side that summer. I was so sick the doctor tested me for polio. Sure, I'd made a mistake, but wasn't I still her daughter? I was a blubbering mess by the time the obstetric nurse came to prepare me. Without a word of explanation, she administered an enema, shaved my pubic hair, and swabbed my vulva with mercurochrome. She was followed by a ham-handed doctor who pronounced me sufficiently dilated to be taken to the delivery room. The last thing I remembered was the anesthetologist. 
telling me to count backward from 10. I think I got to seven. When I opened my eyes, I was in my bed again, stiff and sore and soft around the middle. It was night. The room was quiet. It was over. I wish all the girls were as sensible as you, Rita. Miss Murphy lifted her briefcase onto her lap and unbuckled its hasps. There are social workers who think it does a girl good to hold the baby for a while to say goodbye, but as far as I'm concerned, it just complicates matters. Aren't you glad you took my advice? I was, yes. The way some of the girls blathered on about seeing their babies made no sense to me. What difference would it make to count its toes or find out what color eyes it had? There was no point trying to memorize a face we weren't even allowed to photograph. I understood too well the babies weren't ours to keep. Their real parents, as Miss Murphy reminded us during the group sessions she conducted at the home, were married couples with secure careers and comfortable houses who were eager to adopt. She warned us, too, about the terrible things that would happen if we selfishly changed our minds. Scolding us with a wagging finger, she'd say, a single mother could never provide a baby with everything it needs. And just imagine how that innocent child will be tormented on the playground for not having a father. Then there are your own futures to consider. You girls may still be young and attractive, but believe me, you'll never marry well if you're saddled with a baby. When one of us expressed her hope that she'd meet a nice guy someday who'd be willing to become her kid's dad, Miss Murphy shook her head. Believe me, no respectable man wants to take on someone else's bastard. Her words were harsh, but I appreciated her directness. Managing the girls was part of her job, sure, but we weren't her real clients. Miss Murphy worked for the babies, not their mothers. She put a piece of paper on her briefcase, which was propped on her knees like a lap desk. Now, Rita, sign this document and you'll be free to go. I was as eager as she was to get this over with, but as I reached for the pen, strange things started to happen. My heart rate shot up, my throat got tight, my hand shook as if the paper were generating an impregnable magnetic field. Go ahead, Rita, her voice was sharp, right on this line. As if it never happened, I reminded myself. I was a signature away from putting my worst mistake behind me and getting on with my life. It was probably the lingering effects of the anesthesia that were making me feel so weird. I swallowed hard and gripped the pen. It was awkward leaning over like that with no place to balance my elbow. Miss Murphy tried to help by steadying the briefcase with her arms, but that only obscured the document. My signature looked oddly loopy, but she appeared satisfied. Is that it? That's it. Miss Murphy tucked the paper back in the briefcase, latched it shut, and got to her feet. In six weeks, I'll drive down to check on you, and then you'll never have to see me again. I can't tell you how excited the adoptive couple is. I have one other girl to visit, then I'll come back to get you. With that, Miss Murphy swept out, the scent of Shalimar swirling in her wake. I folded my coat over the suitcase, then went to gaze out the window while I waited. All I could see from the hospital room was a few sparrows hopping from branch to branch in a tree outside, but I watched those burls birds with the intensity of a naturalist. I'd gotten into the habit at the home of staring out the window for hours. There, I'd been rewarded with a sweeping view of the Hudson River, flat and gray when I arrived in January, choppy with ice come February, fast with flotsam by March, golden in the setting sun of April, bustling with fledgling herons in May. I'd been looking forward to seeing the gangly chicks fly from their rookeries along the shore, but there was no going back to the home now. The girls who left for the hospital never returned to say goodbye. They simply went away, clutching their bellies and crying for their mothers. It was part of the process, Miss Murphy explained. Always move forward, never look back. Miss Klein, Mrs. Klein. I turned to see who'd opened the door. It was one of those teenagers who volunteered at the hospital. Candy stripers, they were called, and she did look a little like a candy cane, tall and skinny in her red and white smock. She must not have read my chart carefully, I thought, or she'd have known better than to address me as Mrs. Anything. The, gr the nurses called us girls from the home by our first names, as if we were no longer worthy of the family names our fathers had bestowed on us at birth. But our names didn't matter much in the end anyway. 
The original birth certificates listing us as mothers would soon be secreted away in the agency's files. New ones would be issued, naming the adoptive couple as parents. It was all part of the plan for our babies to grow up, never knowing we existed. Assuming the candy striper was there to ask when she could get the room ready for its next occupant, I answered, yes, I'm Rita Klein. I brought your baby for a visit. The door swung wider. As if delivering room service in a hotel, the girl wheeled in a bassinet. Through its plastic sides, I saw a bundle of blanket. I'll just leave this here, all right? If you need anything, you can press the call button. She stepped out, shutting the door behind her. I stood frozen by the window. I wasn't supposed to see the baby. I didn't even know if it was a boy or a girl until I suddenly remembered asking that very question of the recovery nurse who checked on me as I emerged from anesthesia. A healthy baby boy. He'll make some wonderful couple very happy, she'd said, patting my hand. From your misfortune has come a mitzvah. The misfortune stirred in his bassinet. I shuffled across the floor, hypnotized. He could be anyone's baby, I thought. They all looked pretty much the same, didn't they? I'd never seen this one before. The candy striper had made a mistake bringing him to my room. Maybe she'd mistaken which baby she brought. I checked the label on the bassinet. Above the date of birth were the words, Baby Klein, as if no one had bothered to name him, but that wasn't right. I remember now the nurse asking me for a name. We need it for the birth certificate, she said. His real parents will change it later, so just say the first thing that comes to mind. I thought of David, who wrote the Psalms that were my favorite passages in the Torah. David, who soothed King Saul with his harp and defeated Goliath with his slingshot. David, who fell in love with Bathsheba, even though she was married to another man. I leaned in. I didn't realize at first that the drops splattering the baby's crown were my own tears. When had I started? There was nothing to cry about. All I had to do was press the call button. The candy striper would come and take him away. The baby would be adopted by his perfect parents. I'd go on with my life as if it never happened. Except I couldn't stop looking at David long enough to go push that button. I saw his face through a gauzy haze as if my baby were a starlet in a Hollywood movie. I didn't decide to pick him up. It simply happened. I watched my arms reach out, saw my hands slip beneath his neck and his body, felt my muscles contract to counterbalance his weight as I lifted him from the bassinet. What was it the recovery nurse told me? Seven pounds, nine ounces. Such a precise measurement for such a fleeting moment in a person's life, as if the mass of our cells at the time of our birth foretold something profound about our future. I'd never know what David's future held. The doctor, the parents who were destined to raise him probably wouldn't even tell him he was adopted. When I'd asked at one of our group sessions if that meant our babies would be brought up living a lie, Miss Murphy told us studies had shown it would be more damaging for a child to believe he wasn't wanted by his mother. My eyebrows pulled together in a knot so tight it ached my head. Something wasn't making sense. How could he be unwanted? No one had ever asked me whether or not I wanted my baby. It was as if a girl gave up her right to want anything once she got pregnant out of wedlock. The social workers told us the only thing that mattered was what was best for the baby, and according to them, an unwed mother was no good to anyone, least of all her own child. The circular logic of the argument made me dizzy. Somehow, we had proven our unworthiness to be mothers by becoming mothers in the first place. David was getting heavy in my arms. I sat on the windowsill and rested my elbows on my knees, his skull cradled in my palm. If I were to raise him, I thought, I'd bring him up the Hudson to show him the herons hatching along the shore. I'd teach him everything I loved about numbers and their magic. I'd take him to all the museums and the planetarium, too. I saw it as clearly as a film reel spooling through a projector. I couldn't remember in that moment any of the reasons why those scenes could never be real. Oh, so that's what I'll read right now. <laughs> that's beautiful. Was Thank that, you. Oh, I could just feel that little head so sweet. I love and the, go, ahead, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, it's 
for someone to choose um, adoption for their for their child, it's really wonderful. And so it's it's um, it's really about the process of her choice, and that she really wasn't given much of a choice. And I think that was true for many women. It was called the baby scoop era after World War II until about well until Roe versus Wade, which has now come back around again um, in the United States when people felt more free sexually, but birth control was illegal. If you were not married, abortion was illegal. And, and somehow it, it all became like the girl was somehow bad, you know? And so there was this whole system in place that would funnel uh, pregnant girls into unwed mother's homes Social workers would place the babies. Adoptions were closed. So that's that's sort of where Rita Klein. That's where we meet her. She's like in that system, and she's trying to figure out if that's the right thing for her. But nobody's really asked. And the whole idea of closing the adoptions and and taking those birth certificates, just throw out a name, just say that should work, sure, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, that whole idea of I think that's been flipped over now that mm -hmm. children are starting to. You know, they mm -hmm. started looking for who they were. To, mm -hmm. And medically, too, right? There's a lot of mm -hmm. reasons to know where mm -hmm. it came from. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, learning about that whole process of um, it's better if you don't know that mm -hmm. you're adopted. Such an interesting way that, that the policies and that everything mm -hmm. has changed since, so much since then. But um, is the Hudson Home for Unwed Mothers, is that a real place? No. Um, but there were many unwed mother's homes that operated in a really similar way. One of the books that was really inspiring for me, let me see if I get this on the right side. It's called um, The Girls Who Went Away. There are a number of books about this era, but this was the one that that was the most inspiring. And it's a collection of mostly a first person uh, narratives and memoirs uh, that were compiled by e Ann Fessler. And what was so interesting in reading that was how kind of repetitive they became. Mm. And it was because the social workers were trained in how to convince young women to give up their children for adoption because the social workers were taught that it would be better for the kids to be raised with a mother and a father and a home and, and that sort of standard uh, family st structure. So they believed they were doing the right thing, but they were taught like psychologically what arguments would be most convincing. And so when I read this book, it was it was really wild. Women um, from all across the country with very, very similar experience. That's fascinating. It looks like a great book. That's a, it's really she made Ann Fessler also made a documentary that goes with it. Um, the girls who went away. I think it has a slightly different name from the book. But it, it's really great. It's these interviews with women now looking back on on what happened to them when they were younger. That sounds so fascinating. Can you hold that up again? Sure. I can just see that in case anybody is looking. Because that looks really yeah. intriguing to me. The girls. Who and you can go to, trying to get us at Ann Fessler. Um, a Girl Like Her is the name of the documentary. Mm -hmm. And The Girls Who Went Away is the book. And so Ann Fessler, you can find her website and it links to that. Um, and a lot of other resources there as well. Fascinating. This book um, goes through so many topics though, and so many things that you don't really think about. And this one seems so vastly important because it's the first chapter and everything. It's mm -hmm. such a big topic, but you moved on to some other stuff rather quickly. I had to catch up and say, oh, what's happening? I don't know where that's, oh, oh I get it now. Um, and uh, I want to know, Mm -hmm. how, how you started, like, what inspired you to do this? How did you discover mm -hmm. first? Because, like, mm -hmm. the um, those punch cards is something that nobody's mm -hmm. heard of before. And all of a sudden, I'm opening the page and going, punch cards? Well, I remember those from exams and elementary yep. and stuff like that. How did you get into learning about all of those mm -hmm. and how it, well, mm -hmm. how it led to the rest of your story, really? Well, I'll hold up another book. So it's not something that I discovered. Let me get this centered here. So this is a book by uh, Edwin Black called IBM and the Holocaust. You can see I used it for my research a lot. And Edwin Black is an investigative journalist. So this book has been out for a couple of decades. When, when was it first published? I'll tell you. Um, 2001. And 
so really that was what I relied on. And I, I did I some other archival research as well to fill that out. But the Edwin Black book, IBM and the Holocaust was the main resource for me in that. Um, and I'd always been kind of interested in technology. I read in English translation, I read Heidegger's a question concerning technology back in grad school. And this idea that technology, when we use technology, we learn to see the world differently. Uh, Heidegger, and again, please, if anybody's a real scholar of philosophy and and German, like this is the most reduced version. This is the Cliff Notes version. Um, but that using technology, Heidegger says we it it orders the world for use. That we learn to see things as resources, human resource department. Um, we learn to see things as resources that are organized in a way that makes it easiest for us to use them. And that it becomes so pervasive, you don't really notice that that's the way you're seeing the world. But he's like, that's not the only way to see the world. And what was so interesting for me is when when we usually think about the genocide during the Holocaust, it's almost unfathomable. It's like massive and evil and terrible. And and it it just seems like how could that have even happened? It seems like an aberration. Um, but then when I learned that a, a big organizational strategy that they used to keep track, locate prison, locate people, imprison them, organize the transports, um, keep track of, they used to call it each, um, big concentration camp had its own hollerith in their labor office. And they would send, they were called the daily strength totals. So their numbers, how many people were in this camp, they'd send it back to Berlin and it would get coordinated. So for instance, if you were in a transit camp in the Netherlands in Westerbork, the transit camp that I write about, and the train comes, if that train is going to go to Auschwitz, if it's going to Sobibor, if it's going to Bergen-Belsen, that's been decided in Berlin based on information that they get in these reports. And so there was something about this combination of of this kind of unimaginable, evil, massive, terrible thing that you almost can't even think about. And the the sort of banal drudgery of data processing mm -hmm. um, that, I don't know, it just intrigued me. Yeah. But then in terms of bringing these two stories, because like you said, you read the first chapter, 1960, New York, here's this young woman in the unwed mother's home. And then in the next chapter, you're like, wait, where am I? 1941 in The Hague, in the Netherlands? Like, what is happening? And that really was kind of inspired by my, my two parents. My parents met in 1960 in the Empire State Building. My mom was 19, um, this Jewish girl from the Bronx. And my dad was um, 29. He was not Jewish. So he had a very different experience, but he lived in Rotterdam during the Blitz, um, a bomb dropped just next to their house. Uh, he grew up as a boy during that German occupation. They saw their neighbors who were Jewish being arrested. And it was just this sadness, this heaviness that my dad carried with him his whole life. So in a way, the two storylines in this book are kind of inspired by the different backgrounds of my two parents. Yeah, your dual timeline was really, really fleshed out. I find dual time sometimes, I've talked about this before, but sometimes I find dual timelines really difficult to do. Mm -hmm. Because if your heart is with one story, mm -hmm. mine's always with the past story, mm -hmm. to bring the other story to life. Um, and I was just laughing because uh, you just read Mrs. Murphy saying, always look forward, never look back. And then mm -hmm. there's this beautiful timeline. Um mm -hmm. Did you, did you mean to do the dual timeline all along or did you figure that out along the way or how did that come to be? Um, I, when did they start working together? I think once I got pretty serious about this book project, because the ideas had been knocking around in my mind for a while. Um, and I think probably originally it was going to be just the World War II uh Right, section. setting, yeah. But then when I thought about um, bringing the two different timelines together, um, 
I really liked that because yeah. as the book goes on, you know, it, it, it gives the reader a kind of um, question you're always asking, like, wait, how are these going to go together? Because it's, you're very far in the, in the book before these timelines start to merge. Yeah. Um, and so I liked that. And it, just the sense of, you know, how history is never really in the past. It's always informing us in the present and people carry that with them into whatever they're doing in the moment. Um, and I also really wanted the book to be grounded in, it's like 1960 post-war New York City to, um, so that we, we could step away from that World War II era sometimes and kind of bring it more into the, for me, 1960 is a pretty present time period. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't feel so historic. Yeah. Do you know that they've actually said the 1980s are now suitable for historical fiction? Really you can call it history. That bothers me. I think it's like a <laughs> year thing. And I went, what? That's not no. right. Um, so this one was your first World War II story. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Did you, that's, that's a really difficult subject. It's interesting to me because mm -hmm. we are all writing about it because mm -hmm. so many different facets. And uh, mm -hmm. every time I read one, it's something that I never, ever thought about. And mm -hmm. yours, I think yours is more, more so than that, because mm -hmm. um, you talk about how you bring, like, technology is black and white, right? It just, mm -hmm. this is how it is and not this is how you feel about it. And mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting how that's changed nowadays how it tells you how to feel basically mm -hmm. when you watch all that um but yeah it's uh knowing about how the computers actually tick through that when you mm -hmm. described it it sounded like stalking warehouse when they send it from mm -hmm. the numbers really mm -hmm. interesting um mm -hmm. that was that hard to kind of get that feeling because when you mm -hmm. were portraying when you were the character because for me you become that character that must have been mm -hmm. so hard to get it through your psyche that mm -hmm. you, you're a number basically yeah. that's all you yeah. are that well it's you know in some weird ways I mean in in the most in the most mild and privileged tiny aspect being on lockdown during the pandemic gave or enabled me to have a little more empathy and to think about people imprisoned about just this sense and and again the from the most privileged and comfortable position but just that's the sort of the low level constant stress the feeling that things are out of your control um not being able to go places and the sort of strange monotony of the days and how it was like every day lasted a year, but a, a week was like a minute. It was all very strange. And so I brought some of that sense into, especially when I described Cornelia Vogel, the other character, her time at Westerbork. Um, I focused mainly on so the punch card computers, which is an aspect of the, the Holocaust. Again, I didn't discover this in any way, but most people haven't really heard much you about it. You discover it, it but you, you found it. That's the thing. Mm. It was there, but nobody else knew about it. Really. Well, not <laughs> you know what I mean. Like yeah. myself, and mm -hmm. basically, a lot of readers have never heard mm -hmm. of it. So I'm going to say you just Well, I hope it's. It, I like to. You know, it is really cool. Like you said, to when you visit a subject that's as um, it in a little like World War II is kind of like so much written about, especially in historical fiction to find a niche that is, is not as well known. Um, I guess the other end of the computers in World War II is the Bletchley Park code breaking stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, so we know there's technology going on, but I hadn't really thought about the way the technology was used first in conducting the censuses plural yeah. um one of the first things the germans did when they would take over a new uh territory was conduct a census because they wanted to find everybody especially everybody with uh, jewish heritage um so that was really interesting and i stayed focused on the netherlands i have felt that personal connection with my dad having been born in rotterdam and the netherlands was a particularly interesting case because the the real man who was in charge of conducting the census and compiling that information um Oh, 
I'm going to remember his name in a second, but it's <laughs> right now I can only think of the fictional character's name. Yep. Um, the real man who inspired my fictional character, Gerard Vogel, um, was apparently not necessarily a Nazi sympathizer, but he was very dedicated to statistics information. Right. And because the record keeping and the information in the Netherlands was so accurate, they were the occupying uh, Nazis were able to identify and locate people extremely efficiently. So for instance, even in, um, in France, under German occupation, it was just kind of disorganized. And the and the man in charge of statistics was trying to resist as much as he could. Mm -hmm. So just even though there were, I, it, it turned out that out of the Netherlands, the highest proportion of Jews from Western Europe were murdered in the Holocaust. And it was really because of being able to find everybody. Right. Wow. Scary. All right, um, I'm going to do a little bit of an about face here because I okay. have a question for you. And I know that a lot of people um, want to know historical mm -hmm. how we research and how we mm -hmm. how we discover what we discover. And those two books are two that I've never seen. How do you find mm -hmm. um, where you're going to do your research? I'm going to take notes for this part. Okay. Well, these two. two how you, um, you even have. You even yeah. have a YouTube series, don't you, about writing historical fiction? And I do, I do. Um, I taught an online course on writing historical fiction, and I, I put my lectures on my YouTube channel, Kim Van Alcamada Author, Ooh, you I think is the, is the YouTube channel. I'll get that um, link from you, and I'll put it underneath. Okay, you. thanks. Um, so, yeah, I think um, for me, what catches my attention is something that's strange, maybe a little dark, and that I'm really surprised to learn. So for Orphan Number Eight, my first novel, the the I was researching the Jewish, uh, the Hebrew Orphan Asylum of New York, which was a real place because my grandfather really did grow up there. My mom said, mm -hmm. and when I read about about a group of eight children who were bald because of X-ray treatments they'd gotten from a woman doctor at another orphanage, I was like, what? Wow. What? Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, like what is happening here? We've got x-rays, women, doctors, bald children, like 1918. And so these are the things that kind of catch my attention. And I think the IBM and the Holocaust, I was probably interested in. I ended up writing my dissertation, which I think seriously, six people in the world have ever read, which is plenty. Um, it was about how we started using computers for teaching uh, college writing in the 1980s. Oh. And the, the thing that kind of caught my attention was how all the articles and things that people thought it was going to be wonderful and students would be free from the tyranny of handwriting and they would express themselves. None of those things are true. Technology makes things more efficient and students, they can research faster, write faster, and then they're done sooner and they can do what they want to do, which is not write papers necessarily. But I think that interest in technology led me to the IBM and the Holocaust. And then my mom, one of my mom's friends in high school went away to have a baby, um, came back. They never talked about it again. Um, and my mom was 19 when she met my dad. They got married and then they had me very quickly after that. I wasn't the reason they got married, but it happened pretty fast. And e even just the idea of being that young and becoming mm -hmm. a mom, you know. Um, so I think... It, those are the things that kind of intrigue me and catch my attention. And once I have those main things, um, I had already been really interested in the World War II experience in the Netherlands uh, under German occupation because of my dad's childhood. So the, the key things kind of come from either my family history or things that catch my attention. And then I start researching further. Right before COVID, the last research thing I did this was um, February 2020. I was in New York City and I went to Barnard College and I went to their uh, library and used some of their archives to look at like the course catalogs and things from the 1960s at Barnard College. And I was supposed to go back in March and go to the Empire State Building, which I hadn't been to in years and years, and do some other things. And then I did not go because, because. COVID was happening. Um, 
And uh, so from that point on, pretty much everything was, you know, internet or library books. And, um, but I, yeah, I worked with some researchers. I don't know. The, the research can get a little overwhelming. So <laughs> I have a bibliography in the book that I really wanted to not like to show off what I did, but to give credit yeah. to, okay. there's so many things that go into it. Yes, for sure. And then this is a special treat because we haven't done this before. And then you put in a lot of creative energy, not just writing, but in promoting and educating. And you made a book trailer, which I love to do. I love doing those. I mm -hmm. never feel like they're really Hollywood, but mm -hmm. they give you a good introduction. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we are going to put that on here right after Kim and I are finished chatting. Mm -hmm. But um, what what made you want to do that? And tell me about that. Well, it was, um, I put it together. I thought about like, what could I do with the skills I have? Cause I, had, I, I'm like, by the time I learn how to do a movie editing program, I really should be writing something. <laughs> um, but I had so many visual sources that were so inspiring and important to me. And some of them were like personal pictures of my dad as a kid and of my parents. And, um, and then other ones were historical pictures. And so I put things together in a, in a PowerPoint slideshow and then I narrated it. And my daughter who Alex Hovid, who actually can do <laughs> video editing, helped me integrate music into it. And so it turned out really nicely, but what I really liked about putting the book trailer together was being able to share some of these visual things that um, were so important and inspiring. So um, it's really focused more on the inspirations behind the story sure. and, and how that came together. Oh, that's great. Okay, so I'm going to put that on right after this. But in the meantime, it's so nice to chat with you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank on. you so much. Um, yeah, it's so such a pleasure. I'm so happy to see you again. Thank you so much. I hope I didn't ramble on oh, no. too it's much. The best part. <laughs> and good luck with this. Thank so you. It comes out one week, July 18, and you can pre July 18. Yeah, know. you can no, pre-order. I say June. I meant July. 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 18. Yeah, July 18, and you can pre-order and. There should be plenty of copies in Canada as well as the United States. And we have a Dutch edition. That's the, the first foreign language that came in. And that was so like meaningful to me. Yes, I can yeah. see that. That's great. I don't know if people understand this about pre-orders, that um, when you pre-order, all of those pre-orders go into um, adding up towards your first week of sales. Mm. So when an author puts out a book and it has tons of pre-orders. Well, that's when it shoots up on the bestsellers list. So I encourage everyone here right now to go and pre-order <laughs> this book and you'll get it in a week anyway. So, um, <laughs> and it, it's a, it's a wonderful book. It's an amazing information and so much insight. And, and oh, both thank time you. periods. I really, I really encourage you to go. Out and, oh, and thank you so much. And there's a beautiful um, audio version mm -hmm. as well. So if I know sometimes I do an audio book um, and, and I think it's going to be really wonderful. The, the narrator is really wonderful. Good. I will take a listen to that. Thanks. All right. So I'm going to try and figure out how to get that on here. Okay. And thank you again so much. Thank you so much. And oh, what a pleasure. My father was six years old when the Nazi blitz on Rotterdam dropped a bomb in his backyard, shattering the windows in the townhouse his family shared with their Jewish neighbors. When anti-Semitic signs went up around the city, Christian families like his understood they didn't apply to them, but after my dad helplessly witnessed his neighbors being arrested and sent to Camp Westerbork, where over 90,000 Jews were transported to their deaths, he realized those signs implicated his family too. Years after the war, my father immigrated to the United States, where he met my mother, a Jewish girl from the Bronx, at the iconic Empire State Building. My mom came of age during a time known as the Baby Scoop era, the years after World War II when millions of unmarried women were pressured into surrendering their children for adoption. When my parents married, their very different histories were united in me, becoming the inspiration for my novel, Counting Lost Stars in which an unmarried college student who's given up her baby for adoption 
meets a Dutch Holocaust survivor searching for his lost mother. My other inspiration was learning how punch card computers were used to organize the Holocaust, especially in the Netherlands. Despite Holland's history of religious tolerance, census data processed on computers resulted in the Nazis murdering a higher proportion of the Jewish population there than in any other Western European country. In my novel, I imagine how a Dutch bureaucrat in charge of census data could become a collaborator in genocide, and also how his daughter might use her knowledge of computers to save the life of her Jewish lover. Counting Lost Stars raises many issues relevant for discussion today, such as reproductive rights, women in tech, rising antisemitism, and the destructive potential of computer technology. I look forward to hearing from you, and thank you.